Hello, my friends, this is Dr. Beter. Today is September 25, 1976, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 16. Last month I recorded monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 15 much earlier than normal on August 2 because of its extreme urgency. In that tape I revealed the locations of multiple warhead missiles and hydrogen bombs which had been planted by the Soviet Union in the coastal waters of 25 countries around the world, especially the United States, Canada, the British Isles, and Western Europe. We were on the threshold of a worldwide Pearl Harbor type surprise nuclear attack, and yet no one in the Federal Government had taken any official action whatsoever to respond to my warnings about this terrible war threat. It was obvious that nothing would be done in time unless public opinion forced it to be done, and so I appealed to you. I told you the truth about our desperate situation, and I ask you to bring about the rescue of our beloved country by applying the kind of pressure on the Government that only aroused, informed citizens can bring to bear. Your overwhelming response was a major shock to the United States Government, and as a direct result of your efforts, action has been and is being taken. Thanks to you, the missiles and bombs in American waters which I revealed in monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 15 have been removed by the United States Navy. Likewise, those around the British Isles and a number of other locations worldwide have also been removed. But the grim fact is, my friends, that we are still in very grave danger because the Soviet Union is not giving up. That means you and I must not give up either. The Soviet Navy is now struggling and maneuvering around the clock trying to re-establish a commanding strategic position for attack because an imminent nuclear attack on our country is still planned by the Soviets. If this attack is to be prevented, two things must be done. First, they must be prevented from achieving the decisive edge in battlefield position which they are now trying very hard to accomplish at sea by means of submarines. And second, the fact that the Soviet Union is preparing to plunge the world into thermonuclear war must be completely exposed not only here in America but worldwide. As I pointed out last month in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 15, the audacious worldwide naval surprise attack which is almost ready to be triggered makes the Soviet Union the all-out enemy of every other nation on earth. Once this becomes known, Russia's military posture will be very awkward indeed. In order to bring you up to date on the events of recent weeks, my three topics today are Topic No. 1, the August Missile Crisis of 1976. Topic No. 2, the United States Intelligence Gap and a new round of Soviet underwater missiles. And Topic No. 3, the undeclared submarine war now underway. Topic No. 1. An increasing number of public figures in our country know about the Soviet underwater missiles ringing our country, but so far only one has come close to warning you about it. At the Republican National Convention on August 19, 1976, Ronald Reagan was invited to the Speaker's platform to say a few words following the nomination acceptance speech by President Ford. After some opening words of a personal nature and brief comments about the party platform he had helped to forge, he turned to what was really on his mind, 
He began, and I quote, If I could just take a moment. I had an assignment the other day. Someone asked me to write a letter for a time capsule that is going to be opened in Los Angeles a hundred years from now on our tricentennial. It sounded like an easy assignment. They suggested I write something about the problems and issues of the day, and I set out to do so, riding down the coast in an automobile, looking at the blue Pacific on one side and the mountains on the other, and I couldn't help but wonder if it was going to be as beautiful a hundred years from now as it was on that summer day." Unquote. With a few words about various challenges we face, he then continued, quote, We live in a world in which the great powers have poised and aimed at each other horrible missiles of destruction, nuclear weapons that can in a matter of minutes arrive in each other's country and destroy virtually the civilized world we live in. And suddenly it dawned on me, those who would read this letter a hundred years from now will know whether those missiles were fired. They will know whether we've met our challenge. Whether they have the freedom that we have known up to now will depend on what we do here. Will they look back with appreciation and say, Thank God for those people in 1976 who headed off that loss of freedom, who kept us now a hundred years later free, who kept our world from nuclear destruction? And if we failed, they probably won't get to read the letter at all because it spoke of individual freedom, and they won't be allowed to talk of that or read of it. This is our challenge." Unquote. It is no coincidence that nuclear missiles came to Ronald Reagan's mind as he looked at the waters off the California coast. We had been in telephone contact with one another since August 11, and he knew all about the Soviet underwater missiles when he said those words of warning I just quoted. But most of his audience never realized what he was driving at, thanks to the total absence of any other clues about the Soviet threat from the government or the major media. So the fate of our beloved nation, and therefore of the whole world, rested during the month of August 1976 in the hands of those who heard my charges and acted on them. Here is what happened. During August the United States Government came under steadily mounting pressure from people like yourself all over the world who sent copies of my tapes, relayed my charges, and demanded action. The first sign that this was beginning to take effect came on August 14, 1976. On that date I learned that a secret code name had been assigned to the Soviet underwater missile program. However, action to remove the missile still had not been approved and was not going to be approved unless such action was forced by public opinion. Meanwhile, the first concrete action in the August Missile Crisis of 1976 was taken not by the United States but by Canada. On August 17, 1976, the Canadian Navy had found the Crescent Beach Missile near Vancouver, British Columbia, but lacked the capability to retrieve it. Prime Minister Trudeau, receiving no cooperation from the United States Government at that time, called Soviet Chargé d'Affaires Nikolai Makarov in Ottawa and demanded that the Soviet Union itself come and remove the missile and remove it they did. On August 25 the Vancouver area was visited by three Soviet ships, two destroyers, the Sposobny and the Genefny, and a tanker called the Elim. Rear Admiral Vladimir Varganov arrived aboard one of the ships, using this goodwill visit as a cover. By the following afternoon Canadian divers confirmed that the missile was gone. Meanwhile, Great Britain had also begun taking serious action in order to rid herself of the twelve underwater missiles and bombs ringing the British Isles. On August 18, 1976, Prime Minister Callaghan called a special Cabinet meeting at 11 a.m. London time. Present were the First Lord of the Admiralty, 
the first Sea Lord of the Admiralty, and several fleet commanders. The purpose of the meeting was to listen to my monthly AUDIO LETTERS No. 14 and 15, which had gone to England by diplomatic pouch. They already knew that my information was accurate because of the Soviet missile discovered the previous day in the waters near Vancouver, so the Royal Navy wasted no time in taking action. By August 27, 1976, all but one of the missiles had been removed, and that one too was retrieved shortly thereafter. By late August the United States was at last taking action too, prodded into it by still building public pressure. For once President Gerald Ford acted on his own, overruled Rockefeller agent Henry Kissinger, and gave the go-ahead for the Soviet bombs and missiles surrounding the United States to be removed. Having been unleashed at last, the United States Navy worked fast, acting on the information in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 15. By the evening of August 26, 1976, seven of the Soviet weapons in our waters, six missiles and one hydrogen bomb had been removed, and by August 31, 1976, the waters along the American coastline had all been cleared. At this point the threat to the United States that I had spelled out last month had been eliminated at last using the very information I had made public, but the government in general and the military in particular were still under heavy public pressure and under the assumption that the Soviet threat was now over and done with, they chose a technique which has become standard practice in Washington today. It's called plausible denial, a particular type of bureaucratic double-talk. The Joint Chiefs of Staff and the United States Navy had just completed an operation to remove the missiles around our country, a job potentially so hazardous as to defy imagination. In short, they had done their duty, and the Navy especially deserves our thanks for accomplishing their task without anyone being hurt. They should be acclaimed as heroes, and our whole nation should be rallying behind them with justified pride. But my friends, in the nightmare world of step-by-step -step surrender to the Soviets called détente, it doesn't work that way. Even our military leaders are so thoroughly hemmed in by the One World Web that the only way that they can do their duty in the face of such a Soviet threat is to hide the fact that they are doing it. And so, as soon as the missile removal operation had been completed around our shores, plausible denials of my charges began being issued by the United States military. This began on August 31, 1976 when Vice Admiral B. R. Inman, Acting Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, answered an inquiry sent to the Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld weeks before by Senator Harry F. Byrd, Jr. of Virginia. Admiral Inman's letter gives a number of arguments as to why any prudent government, including the USSR, would presumably refrain from planting such missiles and bombs in our waters. But the real crux of his plausible denial letter is the following sentence, quote, There is currently no evidence indicating the Soviets have placed underwater nuclear devices, including missiles with multiple warheads, within the territorial waters of the United States." Unquote. Technically, Admiral Inman was telling the truth because as of August 31, 1976, when he wrote this letter, all the evidence, the missiles and bombs, had been removed from our waters. But the impact of his letter, if read casually, would seem to be that my charges never had been true. By the same token, General George S. Brown, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, wrote me the following day on September 1, 1976. His letter has been photocopied and sent all over the world by the Pentagon. I will now read it in its entirety. Dear Dr. Beter, Your recent tape report alleging that Soviet nuclear warheads and hydrogen bombs have been planted in the coastal waters of the United States has been brought to my attention. 
I have investigated these assertions and find not a shred of truth to any of your statements in this regard. Let me assure you of this country's capability to detect any such aggressive actions by the Soviet Union or any other world power. We stand ready to evaluate and comment in advance on any such information you may acquire in the future which impinges upon the vital issue of our national security. Sincerely, George S. Brown, General, USAF." Unquote. The seeming impact of General Brown's letter, read casually, is that my whole story about the missiles was a fake. But the real key, once again, is the word FIND, present tense. Furthermore, in the last sentence General Brown actually signaled me that the door would be open if I acquired more such information, and by the time his letter reached me I had more such information because, as I said before, the Soviet Union is not giving up. Topic No. 2 On the afternoon of September 7, 1976, I received General Brown's letter of September 1, which I just read you. Ironically, I also learned on the same day, September 7, that Round 2 of the Soviet underwater missile crisis was just beginning. Three underwater missiles were now threatening Los Angeles, and San Diego was once again targeted by an underwater missile close by. Accordingly, I answered General Brown's letter as follows. Dear General Brown, Today I received your letter of September 1. I fully understand the position you are taking at this time. However, other governments have not taken your position. They know the truth. I know the truth, and so does President Ford. And the truth is that during the month of August 1976 a surprise Soviet nuclear attack of worldwide proportions has been partially averted. Make no mistake, the huge buildup of Soviet nuclear missiles on land and in the sea worldwide continues to be a clear and present signal for an imminent surprise attack of immense proportions. In 1962 we had a Soviet missile crisis in Cuba. In 1971 we had the Soviet missile crisis in Canadian and United States territorial waters which was kept from the American people. And now once again in 1976 the world is experiencing yet another Soviet missile crisis. The world must know of the courage of President Ford as Commander-in-Chief in moving aside unbelievable obstacles in order to begin to meet the Soviet challenge last month. In your letter you state that, quote, We stand ready to evaluate and comment in advance on any such information you may acquire in the future which impinges upon the vital issue of our national security." Unquote. In view of this and the urgency of the situation, I respectfully request to meet with you privately in your offices within the next ten days. At that time I will present evidence of the validity of all my charges, and under specific conditions I will advise you of other strategic locations of Soviet nuclear missiles planted in our coastal waters and elsewhere of which you may not be aware and which constitute a clear and present danger to our national security. Sincerely yours, Peter Beter. Shortly after my registered letter reached the Pentagon, Navy Captain Sidney V. Wright, Jr. called on behalf of General Brown to arrange a meeting with the General. We agreed on meeting in General Brown's offices at 3 p.m. Thursday, September 16. An associate accompanied me to the meeting as a witness, and promptly at 3 p.m. the meeting began with General Brown and Captain Wright, who tape recorded the meeting with my consent. In spite of the public posture which he has so far had to maintain, General Brown told me that he had overruled his staff in order to meet with me, and although he couched many of his comments with considerable care, our discussion lasted for well over an hour without interruptions, without telephone calls, and without any cutoff because of time. I gave General Brown a special tape for his ears only 
revealing the locations of 48 new missiles threatening the United States, and within two days the United States Navy was already at work removing them. In addition, General Brown made three commitments to me, and I made one to him. To fulfill my own commitment, I sent the following registered letter to him on September 17, 1976. Dear General Brown, Thank you for affording me the opportunity to meet with you in your offices yesterday for over an hour. During our conversation I mentioned that the Soviet nuclear device, which was removed from Seal Harbor, Maine, had been taken to a location near Otis Air Force Base on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and that it was still there as of the time of my meeting with you yesterday afternoon. You requested that I provide you with details about its location. The facts are that the Seal Harbor nuclear device was in the process of being retrieved by the United States Navy late Saturday, 28 August 1976, and was on the beach at Seal Harbor waiting transportation by the afternoon of 29 August. That evening it left Seal Harbor by truck, which took it to an airport at Augusta, Maine. On the afternoon of 30 August the nuclear device was flown from Augusta, Maine to Otis Air Force Base, Cape Cod, where the airplane touched down at 17.13 EDT, 30 August 1976. From Otis Air Force Base this nuclear device was transported to a remote location on the west side of Buzzards Bay. For over two weeks the device stayed in that location, which is between one and two miles east of the small town of Marion, Massachusetts, on a small peninsula the tip of which is known as Butler's Point. The coordinates are 41 degrees 42 minutes 0 seconds north, 70 degrees 43 minutes 30 seconds west. The Seal Harbor weapon remained there until about 2200 EDT last night, 16 September 1976, but then Less than six hours after my meeting with you yesterday afternoon it left this location. As of today this weapon is in a new location about 24 miles west of New London, Connecticut, with the approximate coordinates 41 degrees 19 minutes 0 seconds north, 72 degrees 31 minutes 0 seconds west. If I had not known about this latest move, the result would have been an echo of your letter to me of 1 September 1976, in which you state that you, quote, find, unquote, no evidence to support my charges. Your letter of 1 September 1976, of course, was written 43 days after I first made my charges, and only hours after the Soviet missiles had all been removed by the United States Navy. Sincerely, Peter Beter." Unquote. My friends, General Brown is laboring under the handicap of an intelligence gap created by none other than Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Allied intelligence sources inform me that they have become gun-shy in sharing some of the information they give me with the official intelligence community of the United States, because invariably Kissinger betrays it immediately into the hands of the Soviet Union. Large segments of the United States intelligence establishment are so independent that they do not consider themselves accountable even to the President. Instead, they work under the direction of Henry Kissinger who owes his power to the four Rockefeller brothers and who also works in the interest of the Soviet Union. Of course, many of our intelligence people are still patriotic and loyal to our country, and they are doing everything they possibly can to protect our nation. Through their efforts, the Joint Chiefs of Staff first learned about 90 days ago that missiles and bombs had been planted in American waters by the Soviet Union, but due to the intelligence gap they were unable to obtain complete information about them. Only when I publicly revealed this information last month did they obtain it, 
and even then, had I related to them privately instead of making it a public issue, Kissinger would still have been able to block any action to remove them. The signs of our growing intelligence gap are all around us. A few years ago the United States was believed to be far, far ahead in multiple warhead technology for missiles, yet as far back as 1971, as I revealed in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 14, short-range Soviet missiles with multiple nuclear warheads were found in our own waters. A few years ago no real threat in naval aviation was anticipated from Russia, but two months ago, July 1976, the first Soviet aircraft carrier Kiev entered the Mediterranean through the Bosphorus Straits, boldly violating the 1936 Montreux Convention as it did so, and instead of the stubby little aircraft the Pentagon had expected, the Kiev carries sleek, advanced aircraft comparable to the American F-4 Phantom with the additional capability of vertical takeoff, and the Soviets are building at least four more carriers like the Kiev. It is now in the North Sea to bolster Soviet air power, which is a weak spot in that area for them. The military philosophy of détente, as expressed to me by a very high military official, is, and I quote, we watch what they're doing, and they watch what we're doing, and that's good. It prevents miscalculations." Unquote. But, my friends, this means we are in a perpetual war game with all of our lives at stake, and because of the intelligence gap that now exists, a miscalculation cannot be prevented. Instead, it becomes inevitable, and with it thermonuclear war. Topic No. 3 Yesterday, September 24, 1976, Secretary of the Navy J. William Mindendorf II delivered a very important briefing at the News Media Luncheon of the American Security Council held at the Army-Navy Club here in Washington. He spoke of things that every American should be alerted about, but the major news media treated it as a non-event. The Baltimore Sun and the Washington Star carried stories which dealt with splinters from Secretary Mittendorf's speech, but missed the basic thrust of his comments. The Washington Post and the New York Times and the rest of our major media said nothing at all. Here at home, Another attempt to warn the American people has so far been muffled and silenced. But half a world away, Radio Australia did give Secretary Mittendorf's speech the attention it deserves, and they did not miss the point. Here is what Radio Australia had to say at 8 o'clock this morning, Eastern Daylight Time, quote, A warning that the growing strength of the Soviet Navy has created an emergency situation for the United States, has been sounded in Washington by the Secretary of the Navy, Mr. William Mittendorf. He also said that the emphasis being placed by the Soviet Union on civil defense has another ominous trend. Mr. Mittendorf said the Soviet Union now has 345 submarines, many of them nuclear-powered and armed with missiles capable of hitting every city in the United States. In contrast, the United States has only 169 submarines. Mr. Mittendorf said that it is evidenced by the Soviet Union that the 40,000-ton Kiev-class aircraft carriers, with four more believed to be under construction, was another ominous change for the near future. Mr. Mittendorf said that while the Soviet Union was producing submarines and warships, by leaps and bounds the United States Navy had been almost cut in half to 474 ships over the past six years." Unquote. Is the Secretary of the Navy crying wolf? I submit he is not, knowing what we know. In international law, 
mining the harbors of another country is an act of war. The Soviet Union has already invaded our territorial waters not merely with mines, but with hydrogen bombs and multiple warhead nuclear missiles. By contrast, we have placed no such weapons around the Soviet Union, so the actions already taken by the Soviets are acts of war and pure aggression. As I say these words, an undeclared submarine war is going on between the Soviet Union and the United States in the water surrounding our country. So far it is still at the stage of maneuvering for attack on the part of the Soviets who now have nearly half of their submarine force surrounding the United States. The challenge before us now is to prevent this from escalating into all-out war as planned by the Soviet Union. To do this we must all understand what we are up against. As I explained several months ago in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 13, war does not just happen. It is planned and triggered deliberately by those whose lust for power is more important to them than the lives of their fellow men. Conspiracy and double-cross are standard practice in such things. The threat of nuclear attack by the Soviet Union that hangs over us right now is tied directly to a three-way power struggle involving the Rockefellers on one side, the Soviet Union on the other, and in the middle, Henry Kissinger, who serves both sides. The four Rockefeller Brothers, of course, have been double-crossing and using the American people for decades economically, politically, and in wars for their own enrichment and expansion of power. These things I've revealed in my previous tapes, but in particular they have been working hand-in-hand -hand with the Soviet Union. Now the Soviet Union is double-crossing them, trying to use their immense military might which has been built up with Rockefeller aid in order to seize complete world domination in a flash. For 20 years Henry Kissinger has been a key Rockefeller agent in the Rockefeller Soviet Alliance, and in recent years has been the exclusive, I repeat, the exclusive negotiator with the Soviets in many sensitive areas behind closed doors. But Kissinger sees the handwriting on the wall. He knows Nelson Rockefeller is trying to push President Gerald Ford aside to take over. Now if that happens, a Rockefeller will be within reach of the dictatorship he has craved for so long, and Kissinger will have outlived his usefulness to the Rockefeller brothers, becoming instead a dangerous liability because of what he knows. Kissinger has now tilted towards the Soviet Union, whom he thinks will be the winner in this struggle. Not only has he created the intelligence gap I told you about earlier, but he has also used his unique position to withhold certain critical information even from the four Rockefeller brothers. Not only did he negotiate the agreements between the Rockefellers and the Soviets, concerning the nuclear safe zone for the benefit of the Rockefeller Brothers in the planned war to come, but it is he, Henry Kissinger, who also conspired with the Kremlin for the Soviet double-cross that is now underway. The military threat we now face is tied very closely to political maneuverings here in the United States. Nelson Rockefeller at this late date still wants to get Ford out of the way as quickly as possible in the hope that he can turn even this dangerous situation we now face to his own benefit. The financial scandal against President Ford that Rockefeller has had ready to spring for many months is now underway in the form of the investigation of Ford by the Watergate Special Prosecutor's Office. 
But the Soviet threat is real, the time is short, and therefore, as Nelson Rockefeller himself keeps saying, anything can happen. Once he seizes the power of the Presidency, Nelson Rockefeller will have the option of declaring a national emergency to help meet this missile threat, thereby activating all of the dictatorial controls that are provided for in Executive Order 11921, which I discussed in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 14. This is not affected by the bill signed by President Ford on September 14, 1976, which has been falsely represented in some quarters as eliminating the emergency powers of the President. Meanwhile, Soviet military forces are now being deployed in offensive positions. In Europe, over 4,000 Soviet tanks have now been deployed along the borders next to West Germany and Austria. Soviet naval and amphibious forces are ready for action in the area of the Baltic and North Sea, but most ominous of all is the deployment of Soviet submarines around the shores of the United States. In recent days Soviet submarines have been swarming into a position at battle stations along our east, west, and Gulf coasts. As of today, September 25, 1976, there are at least 142 Soviet submarines in position, lined up at precise intervals up and down the east and west coasts of the United States, and concentrated especially in the Gulf of Mexico. The number of Soviet submarines now in position around us is almost equal to the entire submarine force of the United States, which are scattered worldwide. One major advantage the Soviet Union has in this situation is the ability of the Soviet Naval Command to maintain continuous contact with any or all of its submarines. This is a capability which the United States Navy has been trying to obtain for over a decade by means of Project Seafarer, which has been thwarted time and time again. But the Soviet system of communication with its submarines is far more advanced even than our Project Seafarer would be, and enables the Soviet submarine force to operate in close coordination, reacting quickly to any changes in plans. Most of the Soviet submarines now at battle stations around the United States are in readiness for direct participation in warfare. However, certain subs are also still at work planting underwater missiles along our shores. For this purpose the Soviets have a special type of missile-laying sub that is small, highly maneuverable, and able to operate in shallow waters and relatively tight quarters. The missiles themselves are also relatively small due to their short range and their use of satellite guidance and these special submarines are very difficult for our undersea sonar detection nets to pick up because the hull is treated in such a way that it absorbs sonar signals instead of reflecting them. By moving slowly, these submarines also avoid making sound that might be picked up by passive sonar sensors. Thus they move in and out of our waters at will planting missiles and bombs wherever they choose. Thanks to the detailed information handed over by Henry Kissinger, the Soviet Union has been able to turn our undersea sonar nets into another Maginot Line. Since I recorded Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 15 last month, additional missiles and bombs have been planted around the world in certain locations besides the United States. In particular, the British Isles were ringed by 23 new underwater missiles as of September 21, 1976. On that date I relayed complete information to British intelligence so that the Royal Navy can once again take action to remove them. Elsewhere around the world the situation has not changed drastically except in the case of Latin America. As of last month, the Soviet Union 
still had not planted underwater missiles in positions to threaten Latin America, but now they too are targeted. Mexico has six missiles in its coastal waters. British Honduras, Honduras, and Guatemala have one each, while three missiles now infest the waters off Costa Rica. The underwater missile which originally threatened the Panama Canal from the north end has been removed by the United States Navy, but now the Soviet Union has planted three new missiles to the south of the canal in the Gulf of Panama. One is at latitude 7 degrees 52 minutes 20 seconds north, longitude 79 35 22 west. The second Panama missile is at 18 19 24 north. 78, 58, 12 west, and the third is at 7, 57, 17 north, 78, 37, 54 west. One missile lies off the coast of Suriname, two missiles lie off Ecuador, and Peru is also targeted by two missiles. Chile has three missiles in the waters nearby. Argentina and Brazil are targeted by two missiles each. Last month I mentioned that the nuclear missiles in Guyana, which were formerly located around the huge Atkinson airfield near Georgetown, had been moved south to a new location. As of now, they have been moved again slightly north and west to the new position 529-33 north, 58-55-53 west. In addition, there is now a missile resupply base for Soviet subs northwest of Georgetown, Guyana at 6, 56, 24 north, 58, 25, 27 west. At present, the Soviet submarines are also being resupplied with nuclear missiles at stations in Cuba and Nicaragua, where Castro has been working very quietly. In Cuba, there is a nuclear depot near the north coast, northwest of Camagüey, at latitude 22, 7, 37 north, longitude 78, 21, 32 west. Until recently, offensive missiles were also installed in undersea concrete silos along the north and south coasts of Cuba, ready to fire at the southern United States and the Panama Canal, but these have now been taken up. In Nicaragua, the nuclear depot is on the east coast at latitude 12, 49, 42 north, longitude 83, 50, 45 west. These resupply depots are making it possible for the Soviet submarine fleet to give the United States Navy a very difficult time. On September 16th, I gave General Brown a list of 48 new sites around the United States where missiles and bombs have been planted during the first two weeks of September. Two days later, the United States Navy was fast at work picking them up and by now has removed practically all of them, but we pick up one and the Soviets lay down another. Using their missile-laying submarines. The Soviets have planted seven more missiles in new locations around the United States since my meeting with General Brown. As of yesterday afternoon, the United States Navy had already found and removed two of these new ones, one northeast of Vero Beach, Florida, the other southeast of Jacksonville, Florida. As of today, four of the other five are still in place in the following locations near Miami, Florida at 25-19-0 north, 80-12-50 west. In the southwest end of Pamlico Sound, North Carolina at 35-4-20 north, 76-30-20 west. In the northeast end of Pamlico Sound, about 20 miles south of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina at 35-40-0 north, 75-38-50 west and near Valdez, Alaska at 60, 51, 50 north, 147, 50 west. The other new missile was planted Sunday night, September 20, 1976, 
near Bloodsworth Island in Chesapeake Bay at 38 12 25 North, 76 11 55 West, but is now being removed. The Bloodsworth Island missile is a special case, and I will have more to say about it in a moment. Before I do that, though, it is important to mention a diabolical new trick the Soviet Union is now trying in an effort to confuse the United States Navy long enough to replant enough missiles in our waters for an attack. Some sites which have been cleared by the United States Navy are now being used to replant new underwater missiles very close to the exact location used before. The Soviets anticipate that when these locations are given to the United States Navy, they will be entered on the master plot in use by our Navy, and at that point it will of course be noticed that the new report corresponds to a location where a missile has been removed. The natural assumption would be, therefore, that such a new report was simply a repetition of an earlier report and was now out of date. If this happens, the new missile will be overlooked and will not be removed. Just to make sure, however, the Soviet Union is placing the new missiles just far enough from the previous location to prevent our Navy from discovering them by anything less than a complete new search of the area. As of approximately noon yesterday, I can confirm two new missiles which have been newly planted at old locations this way. One is near Gulfport, Mississippi, at latitude 30, 1720 north, longitude 89, 1825 west. The other is near Mobile, Alabama, at latitude 30, 3840 north, longitude 87590 west. Both of these sites are almost identical to the ones which I gave to General Brown on September 16 and which had been cleared by September 21. A moment ago I mentioned a new underwater missile that was planted last Sunday night, September 20, in Chesapeake Bay near Bloodsworth Island, which is about midway between Baltimore, Maryland, and Norfolk, Virginia. The small missile lane submarine installed the Bloodsworth Island missile at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time and then headed back south toward Norfolk, Virginia. As of 10 a.m. the following morning, Monday, September 21, this small submarine with at least one more thermonuclear weapon on board was close to the mouth of Chesapeake Bay but had stopped and was playing possum on the bottom. Its location was about 10 miles northeast of Norfolk, Virginia, at latitude 37, 620 north, 76, 710 west. Upon receiving this information, I immediately called General Brown's office and relayed this information to Captain Sidney V. Wright, Jr. Here was a chance for the United States Navy to catch one of the Soviet missile lane submarines red-handed. By the time you hear this, the Bloodsworth Island missile planted last Sunday night by this submarine will be gone thanks to the action now in progress by the United States Navy. But as of now, the submarine is still there. This Soviet missile lane submarine will stay there, complete with its cargo of mass destruction until our Navy pulls it up and takes it away. Because, my friends, the small Soviet submarine, now resting on the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay, has become a tomb for its crew. Something went wrong with its power plant, and now the Soviet crew is dead. The sub itself, still loaded with nuclear weapons, has now become a gigantic mine in the waters near the biggest naval concentration in the United States, and so it will remain unless and until it is removed by the United States Navy. My friends, the threat of war from the Soviet Union has never before been as great or as imminent as it is now. 
but I remain firmly convinced that even now a shooting war can still be prevented. Our fate remains in your hands, but now I believe more than ever that the American people, when told the truth, are equal to the task. Congressmen and Senators write letters to President Ford or Henry Kissinger and get no satisfactory response. But you, you open the door for communication between General George S. Brown, who heads our country's military establishment, and myself, and I thank you from the very bottom of my heart. Now I ask you to get behind General Brown in the same way. This is more important than I can express, because General Brown, handicapped by the intelligence gap created by Henry Kissinger, is confronted by many opposing forces within the Federal Government who, unlike General Brown, are not loyal to the United States. As soon as you finish listening to this tape, I ask you please to send a letter, telegram, or mailgram to General Brown expressing your support. It took great courage from the standpoint of his own career for General Brown to see me at all, yet he overruled his staff in insisting upon doing so. And under General Brown's command, with the approval of President Ford as Commander-in-Chief, the United States Navy has acted and has so far been able to fend off the intended surprise nuclear attack by the Soviet Navy. Send your letters and telegrams to General George S. Brown, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Washington, D.C., ZIP 20301. Thank him for seeing me. Thank him for taking action, and tell him you are behind him. By doing this, my friends, you can help strengthen General Brown's hand against those who would rather see inaction or outright surrender to the Soviet Union. Remember, your voice counts. If God will grant us the time and the wisdom to do so, I believe the war which is now so close can still be averted. But I would not be honest if I did not urge you to take such precautions as you can for your own protection in the event war does come. The Soviet Union has a massive civil defense program to enable it to survive nuclear war. No such preparations have been made in the United States except for the so-called Federal Relocation Arc, a network of 96 virtually bomb-proof underground cities in which many of the government officials who have betrayed us into war will be able to ride it out in safety and comfort. So the rest of us who are considered expendable are left to fend for ourselves. Almost two years ago, looking ahead to this situation, I recorded my first tape for Audio Books Incorporated entitled, How to Protect Yourself During the Coming Depression and the Third World War. The exact timetable and some other details have changed since then due to unexpected obstacles and failures which the four Rockefeller brothers have encountered, including now their double-cross by the Soviet Union. But the measures I suggested then are still the ones I would suggest now in order to protect yourself and your family. Highly informed individuals who know from their own sources that my present warnings are correct, are actively preparing their own bomb shelters right now just in case the worst should happen. But as I said in conclusion to that first tape two years ago, what we could accomplish to protect ourselves individually was one thing, and what we can accomplish working together was quite another. Now as then, that is where my real hopes lie. And now, my friends, we are working together to save our beloved country. If we will continue without losing heart, and if we will all show our overwhelming support for General Brown, then I have the feeling 
that we're going to do it. It may sound too good to be true, but then so did the concept of freedom that became the United States of America 200 years ago. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.